Kathy pulls the poll. Yep. So our next presenter this morning is Martha, Dr. Martha Shulsky. Um, she's a state climatologist for Nebraska um, and also a, a co-author on the National Climate Assessment um, from 2018 for the Northern Great Plains chapter. And so we're happy to have you, Martha. Um, please feel free to share your screen and start your presentation. Thank you. Great, thanks, Laura. There we go. Hopefully everybody can see my screen there. Um, I appreciate the uh, invitation uh, to speak with you all. Um, I, so I'm also a, a professor in the School of Natural Resources at the university, and I'm gonna give you um, kind of what I share with my class, um, which is an introduction to climate change class. And so I'll talk just a little bit about climate models, um, just get into kind of where they, where they started from and some considerations that we should think about when we use climate models, um, look, look into climate projections and what, uh, what the models are saying for this part of the country. And I'll talk um, also a little bit about some communication strategies that I use when I, when I utilize climate model output in, uh, in talks that I give in my role as state climatologist and, and some things to think about. So. All right. Um, whenever I give a talk about climate change, which is a lot, as I'm sure my, my fellow state climatologist colleagues also do, um, I tend to start off with um, kind of this slide to help frame this issue. When, we're, when we think about climate change, it's something that's, that can be very big and complex and really difficult to wrap your head around. Um, and I'm going to be showing some, some global climate model output, and it can be difficult to understand what does that mean for me here in Lincoln, Nebraska, or for wherever you're, you are joining this Zoom from. Um, and so what one of the things that I start off with is talking about um, these, uh, distilling it down to these five key messages. And the fact that climate change is real and here now, it's not something that we have to wait for it to happen or it's not happening in a far off place. It's, it's real and it's already here and impacting all of us. Um, and those impacts are felt disproportionately. Um, and we're gonna be talking more about this, I believe tomorrow with our, with our featured speaker. Um, those that are, are um, a tribute to it are, are typically the ones that are least responsible uh, for it. Those are gonna be impacted the most. Um, so this disproportionality um, is an issue that we have to deal with when it comes to climate change. Um, and when we think about climate models, we, that's what's driving these climate, climate models is things like uh, carbon dioxide concentrations in the atmosphere, and the fact that people are the cause of it, but we're also the solution um, to it. So a very important thing to remember when it comes to climate change. Um, and then just a few comments uh, that I think about uh, when communicating on this topic is connecting with people. You may talk to audiences that are going to disagree with the information that you are telling them. So one of the things that, that I think about a lot is connecting with people on these common values that we all share that might be related to water quantity or quality or human health or animal health or an issue that is adjacent to climate change. Um, and then finally, the fact that it is not uh, too late. Okay, so just a few comments about climate models, just more generally speaking. Um, you may have never seen the code for a climate model. Um, you know, models are a way that we can mathematically represent what is going on in the atmosphere. We can divide the, the earth and the atmosphere and layers in the ocean um, with these, these grid points. And we can make these calculations at these grid points and we can go forward in time. And that's essentially what, what a climate model is doing. Uh, and these actually stemmed from weather forecast models. So weather forecasting gave rise to climate models. Um, but think of the cl Earth's climate as a system. It's composed of the landscape and what we're doing on the landscape and elevation and urbanization and irrigation, all these ways that we can represent the landscape and uh, water, the, the dynamic oceans, the dynamic atmosphere, the ice and snow, and then finally people. We're a part of the climate system and that's what is driving um, these climate models. And when I talk about these scenarios, um, later on in the talk, that's what that's what's driving it is human behavior, and that's actually one of the biggest uncertainties when it comes to climate models is is what people are going to do in the future. 
So, so it's a very um, complex um, thing that we're trying to model and trying to deal with. Um, so I, I tend to think of climate models as this living planning tool. Uh, models are something that they're constantly being um, improved and worked on. And the, the graphic that you see here was taken from the National Climate Assessment, and it, it goes through kind of this uh, a basic evolution of models where we started off in a very simplistic manner, just looking at a radiative or heat transfer um, of the earth. And then we added more and more complexity when there was more computing power and more observations taken around the globe and a greater understanding of these different processes that take place. Um, but think of these climate models as something that is always um, improving and changing over time. And one thing to consider is the grid scale. How fine of a resolution are you taking, uh, are, are these calculations being made? Uh, and so I've got this ratio on the screen here. If you reduce the resolution, if you increase the grid, grid scale by a factor of two and you enhance um, the way in which we are viewing the earth and everything that's happening in this climate system, if you uh, increase that by a factor of two, then you increase the computing time by a factor of 10. So that's a consideration in, um, in model output is thinking about the computing power that is required and necessary for this. So in some cases that might be a limiting factor um, is just having the computing resources to make these very complex um, calculations. Um, and I, that something I also think about is uncertainty with each climate projection. Um, think of it as, as, as more of a range than an exact value. Um, you know, we have, you can think of weather forecasts where it's going to be 90 degrees today and sunny. Well, think of a climate model as it's going to be between 85 and 95 degrees, for example. Um, so just understanding that there is a level of uncertainty um, with each climate projection and some processes we understand better than others. Um, so things like temperature, we have a greater certainty uh, about temperature projections than we do precipitation projections. That's a bit more difficult um, to get, especially the finer spatial scale that you get. So uncertainty is a key factor. Um, and I think it's really important to have a translator. Um, you know, I, I don't send stakeholders um, to the, the IPCC, for example, Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, or I don't send them to um, a website typically where they can can download these projections. I help in their understanding of that. So I think having somebody um, who, who understands what they're looking at in terms of, of utility, that's a really key um, component of that. And a lot of you I'm sure do that in your work. Um, so one of the um, things that climate models do um, is hind casting. So can we recreate um, the climate that we have had. That's a great way to help train the model, to understand deficiencies in models, um, to, to, I'll talk about a weighted climate model average. The way these climate models are weighted um, is can they recreate um, the past climate? Um, and so I, I use this a lot when I talk to different audiences about climate models is some people don't um, understand them or don't trust them. And uh, so one way that I um, develop trust in them is if it can recreate the past climate, then that's a good indication that it can, can project the future climate with a fair amount of certainty. Um, and you know, I always get the question of natural influences versus human influences. And we can tease those out. And the only way that we, we can recreate the past century of our climate is if we include those human drivers of climate change. Because I'm sure you all have gotten the question, what about solar cycles? What about um, these other factors that influences our climate, natural variability? 
Yes, they do occur, they are important, but the only way that we can recreate our climate is if we have this human influence um, and especially this greenhouse gas component. Um, and so again, that's what is driving these future climate projections. And I'm gonna be talking about two different scenarios, again, that are based on greenhouse gas emissions. Okay, um, and then finally, something that I talk about in my class is um, the fact that all models are wrong in essence, um, but um, their output provides valuable guidance, right? Without models, we don't have an indication of what's going to happen in the future. So they give us more information than what we would have without them. But just recognizing that all models are wrong, but it does give you um, clues to what will happen in the future. And so what I'm going to be um, focusing on, the examples that I'm going to be showing, um, and this image was taken from uh, the U.S. National Climate Assessment. So there was a climate science special report that came out in 2017. And then, um, as Laura mentioned earlier, there uh, was the uh, fourth National Climate Assessment implications that came out in 2018. And so there, there's model output based on these different emission scenarios. So what is driving these climate models is saying, let's double CO2 concentrations and other greenhouse gases. Let's triple them. Um, let's assume, um, so in this image here, let's assume that there is a business as usual. There is no mitigation, which is the high scenario. This RCP 8.5, that's representative concentration pathways. Um, that's the highest scenario. Again, we don't, human behavior does not change um, based on what it is now, um, which is, is a very, quite a scary scenario. We hope that doesn't happen. Um, and then um, I'll also be showing some images from this other scenario, the lower scenario, RCP 4.5, and that is uh, assuming that we take mitigative action, reduce um, our greenhouse gas emissions so that temperatures will start to level off. Um, this even lower scenario that you see here, and again, these, this global average temperature change that's based on, based on the amount of greenhouse gas emissions, um, that is, is uh, not really achievable at this point. Um, even if we stop today, uh, greenhouse gas emissions, this, this is not a likely scenario here. So, so again, the images I'm gonna show in the climate model output, that is from um, this high scenario and a lower scenario. Um, and I should also mention, um, you may have heard the term or the acronym CMIP, uh, which is a climate model intercomparison project. Those are, um, it's a blend. Um, of, or average of looking at 32 models that are run by different agencies and organizations around the globe. Um, and the grid resolution for these models um, is a, it, it varies by model, but it's about one to two degrees longitude or latitude and about a degree of, of latitude is about 70 miles. So, um, so that gives you an idea of the resolution that is utilized for this global model output. Um, and so every time we systematically assess the state of our climate, which in this country happens every few years, um, we're in the next round of national climate assessment, uh, version five, that's going to be coming out um, here in the next year. Um, that's going to utilize this CMIP, again, a coupled model intercomparison project in looking at 32 models that are run worldwide um, and looking at, you can look at an average of those, you can look at the highs, um, what are the high end models and what are the low end models. So we can look at this range of climate model output. Um, but what I'm gonna be showing you um, in the next several slides are um, a weighted, a multi-model mean. And so the, it's weighted based on how do these models recreate this black line that you see here. Um, so that just gives you some background of the models that, that I'm gonna be uh, showing the output from. 
Okay, so in case you um, were not aware, not familiar, um, so in 1990, um, there was a US Act of Congress, the Global Change Research Act. And you can think of it in a similar sense of what the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change does um, as kind of this international unit. Uh, we do something similar um, here in the US. So back in 1990, um, legislation was passed such that um, we will provide for development and coordination of a comprehensive and integrated US research program, which will assist the nation and the world to understand, assess, predict, and respond to human induced and natural processes of global change. So um, the image that is from the fourth national climate assessment. Um, so we have one about every five years approximately. So there is um, the website there for volume two. Um, you can look at sectoral uh, implications of climate change, um, such as agriculture, water, urban, indigenous peoples. Um, there's a variety of sectoral implications and uh, chapters that you can look view. There's also um, regional sectors. So Laura mentioned I was one of the co-authors on the Northern Great Plains uh, region. And so you can, it kind of distills the information from these climate projections and focuses on um, implications of these projected climate changes. So I'll be showing um, images from, uh, from this uh, fourth national climate assessment. Okay, so um, future temperatures. Um, one thing that I, uh, a phrase that I use when in Nebraska when I'm giving talks on climate change is Nebraska's climate future will be different than Nebraska's climate past. Uh, and you'll see that reflected here in, uh, in this, these images. Um, so on the, <clears throat> the left-hand side, that is the lower scenario and that assumes action now. So that's kind of the best case scenario. And then on the right is no mitigation. Business as usual, we don't change our behavior um, or, or reduce our emissions. So um, this is an annual average, keep in mind. Um, it's not seasonal basis, um, it is an annual average. So relative to the near-term climate, um, so kind of the most recent 30-year time period, so we were just talking about 30-year time periods and normals. So relative to, um, we'll, we'll call it the previous normal period, annual temperatures will warm by several degrees in three decades. So this is the mid-century um, average. So that think of, you know, Trent talked about the climate normals. Think about the climate normal um, you know, a few decades from now. And so these scenarios are looking at three to four degrees warmer than what it is now. So a big change, you know, the, the rate of change going forward um, is much higher than what it has been in the past, right? So these changes that we're seeing, they are, they are accelerating. Okay, so let's look um, end of century, which may be kind of far off. You know, most people's planning horizons are not that far, but if you know, if you have children, think about what the conditions will be like when when they are older. Um, you can see in this lower image how um, action now um, limit limits that warming much more so than the business as usual approach, okay? So at the end of, end of this century, the no mitigation scenario, that has up to about eight degrees or higher warming <clears throat> for much of this region. That's, again, that's for an annual average temperature. Um, so uh, to me, this lower image highlights the need for mitigative, putting mitigative action into place, because that's where you're going to see a big difference in, um, you know, middle of the century, both scenarios are pretty similar. But once we get to end of century, we start to see this, these very big differences um, between action now versus no mitigation. So that is annual average temperature. Um, and that can that may not mean um, very much if we if we think about 
okay, the average temperature in Lincoln will be four degrees warmer. Well, what does that actually um, mean? And so, uh, so sometimes I will use statements um, like this when I talk about climate change. And so if you are, are in Lawrence, Kansas, or pick your location in this region, your average, average annual temperature will be like that of present day Tulsa, Oklahoma, for example. Um, or if we go with the no mitigative action scenario, then it will be like that of Dallas, Texas. Um, again, the, the climates don't necessarily translate exactly, but it just gives somebody some perspective um, and, and puts a, a location and some context with that numerical value. So sometimes I will use um, this approach and I'll be talking about a little bit more towards the end here um, about how we use that in a tool that we developed and working with cities um, across a region in the US. Okay, um, so I've got a slide here. Um, let's think about temperature extremes. Okay, so that was average annual temperature, um, but really what I think is, is more important uh, and more useful is when we start to get into the details of exactly how this warming is gonna be taking place. You know, minimums will probably warm more than maximums. Um, winter um, will warm significantly um, compared to other seasons. You know, how, how do we feel this warming taking place? So one um, example would be temperature extremes. Um, so mid-century, this high emission scenario, um, days above 90 degrees, um, there are, uh, the image that you see here is from a downscaled climate model. So we take this global climate model and we downscale it to more of a regional scale. So you see a little bit more, um, a little bit more features that stick out uh, and with this, this, uh, this higher grid scale. Um, so high temperature extremes um, will worsen both in frequency and severity, um, whereas low temperature extremes will become much less. So if you think about this frequency distribution curve for temperatures, that's going to, our mean is going to shift as well as those tails of the distribution. The high temperatures are going to be uh, more, as well as the low temperatures, those are, those are going to be less overall. So let's put some context on this. Um, the, I'll use Lawrence, Kansas again. So number of days with high temperature above 90 um, will double uh, compared to the most recent, or, or you think of that 30 year average. Um, I've also put another statistic here. Um, the average summer high temperature will increase uh, by about 13 degrees um, and make that uh, more like present day Southern Texas. Um, and again, at the end here, I'll show you the tool that I used that was based on this climate model output um, to determine that, um, that that location difference. But again, just putting some sort of context with a numerical value, I think is helpful in some people grasping what these changes actually mean and translate to. Okay, so I'll shift um, to precipitation. And, um, you know, I've heard the, the um, phrase used is that wet areas get wetter and dry areas get drier. Generally, that's the case. Um, there are some nuances to that, so it doesn't apply broad scale. But in general, if you live in a wetter part, you know, kind of the northern tier and the eastern half of the U.S., then overall, on annual basis, we're likely to see wetter. Whereas if you're in a drier climate, um, that's going to probably intensify um, due to climate change and you will be be drier. Um, but what's interesting with precipitation is looking at shifts and, and how this um, precipitation changes play out so that during the colder time of year, winter and spring, um, those are likely to be wetter. Whereas during summer and fall, or summer in particular, that's likely to be drier. Um, now, on these images, you see some red dots, mostly in the northern tier. Um, in general, you can think of that meaning uh, translating to higher certainty of that. There's greater confidence um, in the output and um, there's a greater signal 
of that trend when compared to natural variability. Um, conversely, when you see these hatch lines, that means there's lower certainty. So we're not as confident in that signal um, when compared to natural variability. So this overall shift in timing of precipitation throughout the year, more precipitation coming at the colder time of year in general, less precipitation during the growing season. And when, when we need precipitation, that's kind of a, a theme of this climate model output. Okay. Um, so let's think about um, how we receive this precipitation. So it's generally more overall over the course of the year. So how will we get that precipitation? Um, for, for the Midwest and Northeast in particular, part of the US, we have seen an increase in heavy precipitation events. Um, for much of the country, that trend is likely to continue. Um, and this has relevance and importance for the effectiveness of the precipitation. Um, so how, how much we would get, do we receive uh, over a certain time period that translates to how much, uh, how effective it is, how much uh, can infiltrate the ground versus how much runs off. Um, it has implications for erosion or think of springtime and getting uh, working the fields, for example, um, it has implications for stormwater management, um, but a theme of climate model output is more of our, a greater percent of our precipitation is going to be in these heavier events. Okay. So, um, Future drought conditions, drought is um, uh, drought and flooding are key issues um, for this for this part of the U.S. Um, drought can, can be um, difficult, uh, more difficult than temperature and precipitation to look at a distinct um, projection or signal, um, and and even looking back at historical. Um, droughts that we've had, like 2012, um, it's it's difficult to definitively put a human fingerprint on it and and direct causation um, due to human activity. For example, um, there's you know it's an integrator of both precipitation and temperature. There's timing issues. Um, drought itself is very difficult um, to to define um, and to view. So there are some um, um, some difficulties in thinking about a climate projection of drought, um, but um, the model output. So what you're seeing here is um, let's look at soil moisture. You know how much water do we have? Um, this happens to be the top layer of soil. I believe it's only to 10 centimeters, so it's only looking at the top four inches. Um, and you see a lot of brown on this map, and that means that the uh, especially by the end of the century, we will start to see um, kind of that signal of, of increasing frequency and severity of drought. Um, note here that I have medium confidence in soil moisture projections. And so, um, so the models are not, uh, we don't have high confidence um, in these specific projections. But if we think about the temperature increase that I showed, that seasonal shift in precipitation, um, a, a trend toward more extreme events, um, the, all those factors combined that, um, you know, that's pointing to um, an increase in frequency uh, or severity of droughts. Um, I know, just thinking about what we've seen in Nebraska is a greater um, frequency of shifting toward uh, wetter and drier conditions and going quickly from one extreme to another. So that is something um, that, that will certainly be in play as we think about climate change. Okay, um, so so just you know, there there's there are many different variables that we can 
um, look at for these climate projections. And, um, you know, I've only shown you a snapshot. And what I typically do when working with stakeholders, sometimes specific projections are more important than others. And so, uh, to me, you know, it takes it takes a lot of working with those end users of, you know, whatever aspect of climate change that is specifically of interest to you. It takes kind of getting into the weeds and the details because um, location matters and timing matters and all these things play a role. Um, but just if we were to step back and think just broadly, um, some of the takeaways here that I see is that rate of warming in the future, it will increase at a rate that we have not seen. Um, that precipitation shift, I think is very important. So generally wetter overall, um, less so if you're from say Western Nebraska or Western Kansas, we start to get into that drier area, but in general, um, wetter um, overall shift in precipitation um, and managing water resources um, in this generally wetter regime, but punctuated by drought events, right? We will still have um, these drought events and these extremes and shifting quickly from one extreme to another. So these are kind of some key overall messages as I see it uh, when it comes to future climate change. Um, Okay, so I, I think I mentioned this one bullet point, planning for an overall warmer and wetter climate, but one that's punctuated by drought, by flood, uh, by heavy rainfall, by heat events, and those kinds of extremes. Um, what is also important, um, and, and Trent made some really good points um, about climate normals, and he showed kind of some details of these changes, um, how things differ from month to month, and one thing that stuck out to me that all of you probably remember is how cold it was this February and this Arctic air outbreak um, and this kind of a breakdown of the polar vortex that some say is tied to climate change because, um, because of changes in sea ice, things going on in the Arctic that translates down to the mid latitudes. Um, but Feb February's over the near term have gotten colder. So here you're seeing February temperature rankings. Um, it, was, it was top 10 cold for a lot of the Great Plains and, and Southern uh, parts of the central US. Um, but recognizing that recently Februarys are cooling. So um, taking these recent trends into account um, when you're looking at climate model output. So we can look into the future, but it's also important to look at what these recent climate trends are and even seasonal, um, seasonal scale outlooks. And we're gonna be hearing more about that later. So uh, in my view, it's, it's important to look decades into the future, but also in terms of near-term management, we have to take into account these recent trends, these changes in normals, um, as well as even the seasonal outlook scale. Um, and then additionally, there's non-climate influences that play a role, right? If you are um, concerned with agriculture, um, then there's markets, there's um, extreme events that happen on a global scale. There's all the, there's trends and changes taking place that are not climate related that also um, complicate things and factor into planning efforts. Um, all right. So um, I just wanted to um, make mention of um, the flood of, of 2019. You know, that was a big, large scale event that impacted um, much of Nebraska and Iowa and kind of the central part of the US. Um, when it comes to these, these big events like the flood, that's something that's really difficult um, to um, to determine uh, based on a climate model, you know, predicting 30 years into the future. Um, something like the flood of 2019 is, is really difficult to, um, to get a handle on that far out in the future. And the climate models, the confidence um, is just not quite there um, to understand that. And when it comes to these big events, you know, the question that I got a lot was, did climate change cause this event? Um, and 
And so my answer to that is um, how much worse was it made by climate change? Because it is here um, and it's impacting all of us. Um, but so in terms of these big events, the antecedent conditions are really critical and timing can be everything. Um, you know, this, this, this very quick uh, rain on snow event um, with snow melt that happened in frozen saturated soils, the antecedent conditions um, played a sig very significant role. Um, and it's things like this, the timing and the details are really difficult um, to, to ascertain and to get from a climate model projection. Okay, um, so um, location, um, that that matters a whole lot. And so, you know, the images that I showed are on this very large scale, but um, this location and specific conditions um, of a particular area, the geography, the, you know, where's the water table? What are these local scale conditions that also play a role and, and contribute or can exacerbate um, the, uh, the, the projections? You know, you know, can make them worse or can ameliorate um, these these changes in climate. That that really does matter, and so it's it's important to um, kind of look at at the details when you're thinking about climate projections, um, and also recognize that the spatial or even temporal scale of the decision maker might not match that of the grid scale and a climate model. So again, it, it's a good tool, but things might not always um, quite match up in terms of what somebody wants to get out of a climate model and what a model can actually you know, accurately um, describe. Um, so that's when things like a regional downscale um, is important to add detail or somebody, um, you know, a climatologist or, or somebody who can help interpret these climate model output uh, is, is really important. And let's see, just keeping a watch on the time. Um, looks like I am um, almost out of time. So I apologize. I'm going to um, skip through to my last slide here because I wanted to, um, to mention where um, the statistics that I use um, and, uh, earlier in the presentation where those came from, just so you have a link for that. Um, so just, just to end here, some closing comments. Um, there was a, a project in which the High Plains Regional Climate Center and myself um, and the Public Policy Center at Nebraska uh, and worked with um, about a dozen cities in the central US and came up with this tool um, where we incorporated these climate projections. And um, so there's the, the URL address that you see there. And you can um, pick your location in this um, big 10 state region kind of the, the Missouri Basin states and look at um, nor what is my current normal and what is my future normal middle of century or end of century. Um, or you can, um, this uh, sister city here, that um, helps to kind of translate this climate model output and says, um, okay, if this example that I gave here, if I am in um, Grand Forks here, the high temperature during summer under this high emission scenario, a few decades out in the future, that will be more like where Laura is talking to you from. So it, it helps to put some sort of context to this climate model output. So um, I'm happy to um, share my slides. I realize I didn't get through all of them, but I'll end there with my contact um, information and not sure if I've left any time for questions or not. No, nope, that's great. Thank you, Martha. Um, and for those of you in the audience, we have a, a little poll, if you don't mind responding to that. That's anonymous feedback for us and for Martha. Um, you did already just answer a question we had in the chat about where to find the city comparison. So thank you for hitting on that. Um, another question, we have two other questions. Um, do models take into account human population? In the past century, it has changed dramatically. Um, 
Yeah. So in the future, like those representative concentration pathways, that does take into account energy consumption and population and kind of the, the human behavior side of it. So I know going forward and what is forcing and influencing those models is driven by, by that human component. Um, so when they hindcast going backward, um, that's a good question. I'm not sure if uh, I know greenhouse gas emissions are a part of it, I'm not sure how you know population would be um, a, a part of that, but it's more driven by emissions uh, as opposed to population per se. All right, thank you, Martha. Uh, we had another question, but it looks like you already answered it in your comments. Um, let's see if there's anything else here. Um, we could take one more question if there's anybody last minute, either in the Q&A or the chat. Okay, oh yeah, one more question here, Martha. Um, do you see any confusion with the city's tool and weather or climate differences? Often that message is hard to interpret for the public or users and this could be difficult to understand. Yeah, good question. So um, when uh, I've not, I've not been made aware of kind of confusion in that. I know when I communicate about this tool, I I make it clear that um, you know this is just to provide guidance, and it's not, um, uh, it's not really um, an integrator per se of the entire climate, but it's just to give you some perspective. And um, it, this was a tool that was driven by what the cities wanted. And so they found it to be helpful to put some sort of context with it. Um, but I've, I've not had too much confusion of weather versus climate um, in the use of that tool. Okay. All right, great. Thank you, Martha.